Six things you need to start recording vocals. Hi, my name's Joe Novelli. I am a singer and an arranger with professional a cappella group, The Sons of Pitches. I also am a choir master and I work here at Grosvenor Road Studios. So here at GRS, we have the biggest live room in Birmingham, perfect for larger choirs and ensembles. We have an SSL AWS 900 plus desk. We have loads of vintage microphones, including U87s, and we record and mix all kinds of music, choir, rock, trap, anything you can think of. In this video series, I'm gonna take you through everything you need to know from starting with recording vocals at home or in the studio all the way through to some light vocal production. So in this video we're going to start with what you need to record your vocals. Whether you want to record at home or in a studio there's things you need and there's things you need to know and think about and today we're going to look at that. Let's get started. So Number one, and potentially the most important thing, is finding the right room to record in. And what I mean by that is a room that sounds good and a room that doesn't have very much background noise. So if you come to a studio like this, you're sorted. They'll have a room tailor-made for vocal recording. But if you're at home, this is a bit trickier. Firstly, what I would do is listen for any traffic noise. If you've got a room that has lots of traffic noise, that's probably not a good room to record in because your microphone is very sensitive and will pick up all that noise and it will be in your recording, which you don't want. So make Maybe think about having a room that's not next to a road, maybe an internal room of your house where you've got some other rooms shielding it from any traffic noise. That's my first tip. Number two, I would then go in and test that room. I would walk in that room and actually do some of the singing I'm going to record. So what you're listening for here is, is there a big echo? Is what that's going to do is that's going to come into your microphone, you're going to hear that echo and it's going to make your voice sound distant, which is going to make it really hard to get that nice upfront pop sound that you're after. And the other thing to listen for is any resonances. So if you sing and this one note is just ringing out and it just echoes around the room, that needs to be sorted. But there's a few things we can do about that. Point three, we need to try and stop some of these echoes and reflections that you will have in your rooms at home. So how we do this is we take things like heavy blankets, heavy towels, duvets, mattresses, and we put them all around the room. They are going to absorb those reflections before they come into the mic. My tip of the day for this is to start behind you because if you think about it, your mic is here recording your voice. It's going to be picking up sound from this side mostly. So if we can stop the reflections coming in from behind you into the mic, that's going to make the most difference. And the more you can do, the better. If you've got a room with sofas or beds in, that's going to help. So that might be a good candidate for your room. So the last thing about the room is if you want to, you could add a reflection filter like this one. Oh, there it is. So what these do is these go behind your microphone. So your microphone is up here, you're singing into it here. And what it will do is, we're talking about these reflections. These reflections will hit the inside of the reflection filter and be absorbed. And this stops them from going around the room. So rather than having the padding behind your head, which is stopping the reflections coming into the microphone, this is stopping the reflections before they could even bounce around the room. So these are pretty good. The only thing with these I'd say is they can be quite expensive. I think this one cost me about 150 pounds. So it's not cheap, but it can make quite a difference. The only thing I would advise, if you are gonna get one, try not to put the microphone too far in because you will get some unwanted resonances from the reflection filter itself. But these, they do a pretty good job. So number two, you've got your room. The next thing you need is a microphone. So when you come to thinking about microphones, there's kind of two obvious choices. The first one is a condenser microphone and the second one is a dynamic microphone. So just to give you some examples, so this is a Rode NT1. This is a condenser microphone. You might have seen these in kind of a more studio setting. And this one I'm sure you would have seen. This is a Shure SM58, which is a dynamic microphone. So as you can see, they look quite different. This one you sing into like this. This one you sing into like this. But the main differences for recording is this one is going to be far more detailed and it's going to pick up your voice much more naturally. The downside to that is it comes at a higher price. This is about twice the price of this one, but you will get that better, more natural studio sound out of this. 
However, there are some pros to dynamic microphones. So the Shure SM58, you often see this in live use. That's because it's very, very durable. You could run this over and it would still work. So if you're recording in a place where you're prone to knocking things over, it could be a good choice to go for a cheaper dynamic microphone. The only downside with the sound is you won't get the same detail that you will in the condenser. The one big plus to the dynamic microphone is it will reject that room noise a lot more. So if you're at home struggling to find a room that sounds good, a dynamic microphone might be the way to go because you won't get all this traffic noise that you would get in the condenser microphone. So number three, you've got your room, you've chosen your room, you've got your microphone of choice. The next thing we're gonna need for recording is a pop filter and that looks like this. So you can actually make your own one out of tights. I've done that before. I've just got a like knitting loop and put tights over it. So they're really easy to make. If not, they're fairly cheap. But what this does is this will sit in front of your microphone like this, okay? When you're singing, especially with your P words and B words, if you imagine singing into your hand, you get a lot of air coming and hitting your palm. What this will do, the air will hit the pop filter and it will break up. What this means is that that air from your P's and B's is not hitting the microphone because when it hits the microphone, it will make a popping sound. And that's something that is a bit tricky to remedy later. What we want is the pop filter in front to catch those P's and B's. And you don't necessarily need them on a dynamic microphone if that's what you've gone for. These are better at rejecting those pops, but if you can, I would still go for one for a studio recording gives you that extra element of safety and you won't have to worry about those popping noises. Number four. So the next thing you need is an XLR microphone cable going in to an interface. You may have seen one of these before. This is an example of a two input interface. And what you do is you plug your microphone in, it will supply the phantom power, which is something you need if you're using a condenser microphone. And it basically acts as a go-between from the microphone to your computer, taking the signal from the microphone into your session. My tips for choosing an interface is, they don't have to cost too much. This one probably costs 100 to 130 pounds, something like that new. Not too expensive, but the thing I would say is make sure that you've got the functionality you need. So different interfaces will have different things that they can do. So this one, for example, it's only got two XLR inputs or microphone inputs. So if you're recording three vocalists, you're gonna need a bigger interface. The other thing this one has is some outputs to speakers or monitors. So if you're using studio monitors like this, make sure your interface can support those outputs. The worst thing is to buy one that's too small or one that you're gonna use for six months and then in six months think, ah, oh, I need one that's got four inputs and then you're having to spend another bunch of money just to get something that you couldn't do with this. So think about what you're gonna need and this might be the thing that I would kind of future-proof for and maybe get one that's slightly more capable than what you need at the moment because very soon you're probably gonna need more functionality. Number five, so you've got your room sorted, you've got your microphone, your pop filter, and your interface. The next thing you need is a computer with a door, DAW, digital audio workstation. I've got Logic running here, but there's loads to choose from, and there's not a right answer as which is best. It's more important that you choose one and get to know how it works. That's the most important thing. If you've got a Mac, then maybe Logic is a good choice because it's a bit less expensive once you've already purchased the Mac, but it's really up to you. And then in terms of the computer, you don't actually need a really high spec computer to do audio recording. It doesn't need as much power as video editing or gaming. So don't worry about spending loads and loads and loads on the computer. But what I would suggest is if you're gonna invest money anywhere on that computer spec, I would go for storage space. That's been my nightmare when I've been a producer, running out of space on my computer, having to use multiple hard drives, I think it's worth spending a bit extra to get a bit of a bigger hard drive, maybe go for 512 gigabytes plus, just to kind of get that bit of extra space because that's gonna be probably your first hurdle. If only there was an app for that.
So finally, number six, the last thing you need is a set of headphones to record. If you don't have headphones, you're gonna be playing the music out of the speakers and it's all gonna go into your microphone, which is not what we want. So with headphones, there are two choices of headphones. You can get an open back pair or you can get a closed back pair. So an open back pair means that the sides are open to the outside world. So the music will sound wider, which is kind of good for mixing and editing, but it will bleed a lot more when you're recording. So if you're just looking for those recording headphones, make sure you get a good closed back pair. They'll be cheaper as well. The thing I would recommend looking at is make sure you get one with a decent length cable. The last thing you want is to be tethered to your interface, only be able to move this much. Get a nice long cable and that will give you the freedom to record wherever you like. So that is my six things you need to start vocal recording. If you really had to focus on one thing, get that room right. Getting the room wrong will mean that you have a vocal recording that sounds distant and you won't get that upfront pop vocal that you're trying to replicate. So that's what I would focus on and the rest, get what you can afford. And as long as the room's good, it will sound pretty good. And there you go, that's everything. So if you like this video, please do check out the Orcs YouTube channel for more videos and recording tips. If you need a better way to share your music or get feedback from collaborators, head to orts.app and download the desktop app. You can follow me at Joe Novelli Music or the studio here at Grosvenor Road Studios. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. I'll see you at the next video. See you later.